Hello, everyone. Welcome to session nine of LTech 676. I want to start this week by reviewing the mid semester teaching evaluation. Now, 10 out of the 12 of you actually responded to the teaching evaluation. And so I did a little bit of an informal analysis to see what some of the feedback was related to the course. So if you recall, the first item on the evaluation form asked regarding this class, what has helped you learn? And a number of ideas were brought to the table. One of the most common things that was mentioned were the class readings. Folks were really finding those relevant and very interesting. Many of you commented that you like the course video presentations. Several of you pointed out that you liked the concept map assignments. In fact, one of you grudgingly said that those concept map assignments are tedious, but that they're helping you make connections between the readings, videos, and critical reflections instead of all of those things being separate entities and separate thoughts. And of course, thank you to the person who left that comment because that's exactly the point of the concept map assignments. In addition, several of you thought that the critical reflection assignments were well thought out, well curated, and were really helping you think about and apply the concepts we're covering in the readings. Some other areas that folks mentioned that are helping them learn, watching the peer reflections. One of you pointed out that just in general, you're finding the topics in this class really interesting. And then another person pointed out that they really like the fact that the peer responses are limited and the fact that you only have to respond two times and it's not this big undefined assignment. What about things that have made learning difficult in this class? Well, there weren't a lot of things that really that folks pointed out. However, the Saturday deadline received the most mentions. Multiple people brought that up. Other people pointed out that just the topics in general, it's not really a criticism of the course, but just the fact that the topics are intense, complex, and large is making the learning difficult. Several of you said nothing is making learning difficult. And if one of you commented on that the concept maps, that you need more guidance there. One person pointed out the readings are too long. Another person commented that the critical reflections are time consuming. And then another person commented on loom difficulties. And so finally, what recommendations did you make for changes in the class? Well, by and large, the number one recommended change was to change the Saturday deadline. And so Moving forward, we're going to move that Saturday noon deadline so that it's Sunday morning. We're going to move it from Saturday at noon to Sunday at noon, technically 11.55 a.m. So that, that's an easy one we can do. I'm glad you folks let me know. I didn't realize that that was such a challenge for so many of you. So mahalo for the feedback. There were also some recommendations to include more optional synchronous sessions. We will do that. Absolutely. I enjoyed it. I got a lot out of that conversation and we'll schedule a few more of those for those of you who want to connect. Some other ideas or recommendations floated by people was launching a class discord. I actually like that idea. I do want to talk to my colleagues to see how we're handling an LTech discord so that maybe we have a single channel within an existing Discord. So let me look into that and follow up. Another item was less reading. Sorry, that's not going to happen in a graduate course at the 600 level. And then fewer video reflections. And I get that, that those are hard, but we have to carefully balance the outputs and the inputs there. So thank you for that feedback. I'll see what I can do. We are going to change the deadlines. We will have more optional synchronous sessions, and I am going to look into a class Discord. In case you're wondering, here are the five course themes. Maybe I should have shared this with you earlier. This is a slide I share at the end of the class, but this just gives you a little bit of a sneak peek of where we're going. You can see theme four, giving voice and disempowering structural inequalities. And then our fifth and final theme is gender and digital equity. Now, I did want to point out a couple of special things in this week's module on Canvas. So first up, take a look at this highlighted box. I have included the mid-semester evaluation results in PDF form. 
So you might be interested in looking through those and just seeing what your classmates anonymously posted. So be sure to check that out. And then finally, I have posted the final paper assignment, which isn't going to be due until May 8th, but I wanted to let you know that that has been posted. And so you can read through that and just let me know if you have any questions about that. I know some of you really like to plan ahead, especially as we start moving into spring break. Okay, moving on, we're going to continue with theme three, racial and ethnic divides, differences, and needs. And if you will recall, we left off talking about some of the racial and ethnic divides, both in the output of our education system as measured by the PISA, that International Student Assessment, as well as who's getting jobs where. And we had talked about this particular chart showing the breakdown of racial and ethnic divides in Silicon Valley. And so some of you may be wondering, well, why is that a concern? And I wanted to talk a little bit about the real world implications of the racial and ethnic imbalances that we're seeing in Silicon Valley and the people who might be behind designing technology in general and educational technology in particular. Let's look at an example. Now, here is some really interesting work, and some of you may have seen this before, but this is by Dr. Joy Bulamwini from MIT. And in her work, she's actually tested three commercially available facial analysis programs from IBM, Microsoft, and Face++. And she found that those programs demonstrate skin type and gender biases. More specifically, she found that in general, the program's error rates in determining the gender of light-skinned men were never worse than 80%. However, for darker-skinned women, the error rates ballooned to more than 20% in one case and more than 30% in the other two. And she's argued that those findings raise questions about how today's sophisticated neural networks are trained and evaluated. Obviously, there are some inherent biases to this technology. Dr. Bulamwini has been so concerned by the results that she found, she's actually started the Algorithmic Justice League. And the goal of this particular organization is to highlight algorithmic bias and to provide a space for people to voice concerns and experiences with coded biases. And she also wants to develop practices for accountability during the design, development, and deployment of different technological systems. So if you're interested in the Algorithmic Justice League, I would encourage you to go check that out. Now, this brings us to the book by Kathy O'Neill called Weapons of Math Destruction. And I'm sure this is a very popular book. It came out in 2016. It's relevant here in that O'Neill defines weapons of math destruction as opaque mathematical models that embed human prejudice, misunderstanding, and bias into the software systems that automate numerous aspects of our lives. Now, one review of her book argued that O'Neill believes these weapons of math destruction systematically tend to impact individuals from disadvantaged groups, including racial minorities and those in lower income neighborhoods. O'Neill goes on to argue that weapons of math destruction, these mathematical models threaten democracy in the U.S. insofar as their opacity, scale, and damage reinforce existing inequalities through negative feedback loops. And of course, this should be echoing in your mind with Linda darling -Hammond case that because of technology, the situation of compounding inequalities in the United States is actually getting worse. And O'Neill is arguing that big data and the mathematical models based on big data is actually contributing to this situation. And she argues that these mathematical models create a false sense of inevitability through the semblance that they are fair and unbiased. And of course, as we've learned from our nature of technology concepts, that technologies have inherent biases. 
and they have intended and unintended consequences. Now, in her book, O'Neill provides some concrete examples of different mathematical models based on big data and how they are creating different problems. So let's take a look at some of those. One of those problems is one that I'm sure everyone in graduate school is familiar with. And this comes from chapter three of her book. In the focus, the model is the U.S. News and World Report system for ranking universities, programs, and majors. And she argues that that ranking system uses specific metrics that universities are actively able to exploit. And this has resulted in some universities taking actions to increase their ranking in ways that are disingenuous. So this is an example of how a technology, a ranking system, can have intended and unintended consequences. And O'Neill is arguing that the results of this system can be exploited and sometimes the results are disingenuous. Finally, one more quick example is from the insurance industry, where O'Neill argues that models used by insurance companies for setting premiums are opaque. As a paying customer for insurance, you can't see why you're paying a particular premium. And these insurance companies use proxies such as credit scores that in turn reinforce existing inequalities. So again, we're seeing this kind of negative, not so virtuous cycle. So what about in education? Are we seeing big data and artificial intelligence having an impact in education? Well, one way to answer that question is to look at the legacy of a company called InBloom. Now, InBloom was funded in 2011. Some of you may be familiar with this case study. It actually launched in 2013 and then quickly closed a year later in 2014. InBloom was a hundred million dollar ed tech initiative with the aim of improving American schools by providing a centralized platform for data sharing, learning apps, and curricula. It was funded in part by the Gates Foundation. But at its launch, there was public backlash over the intended use of student data. Different stakeholders raised concerns about potentially harming children's future prospects or having that data sold to third parties for targeted advertising. The initiative came into conflict with the public's focus on the vulnerability of data systems and the untrustworthiness of corporations and governments. In the end, in Bloom catalyzed a national discussion about student data privacy, but the resulting practices do not consistently reflect the values of transparency and grassroots engagement. Instead, ed tech vendors have been driven toward closed systems that tend to be independent and piecemeal rather than part of a large open consortium. If you're interested in education data and particularly student data, I, I would encourage you to read The Legacy of In Bloom. Now, I want to connect the case study of In Bloom to theme three. So my question for you is which subgroups of the U.S. population or really the international population do you think would stand to benefit or be hindered by what In Bloom was trying to do and what biases might be baked into the software platforms that leverage and analyze large swaths of student data? Now, I want to close out by connecting back to this idea of a framework for ethical analysis. And last week, we talked about what are we to do as educators? How should we go about making ethical decisions about technologies such as in bloom? or facial recognition, especially in situations where there might be different and conflicting interests. Well, one idea that has been put forward is something called an ethical matrix. Now, this doesn't come from education. This actually comes from, of all places, agricultural science. This particular ethical matrix was put together by MEPHAM in 2000, and its goal is to facilitate ethical judgments on modern biotech technologies used in food production. As you can see, there are three guiding principles, well-being, autonomy, and justice, and there are different stakeholder groups, citizens, industry, animals, and environment. 
In short, Mepham argued that the ethical matrix is a tool that is intended to clarify and assist discussion about ethical problems and dilemmas. Now, people who have used the ethical matrix in public participation exercises have concluded that it can help identify issues and focus debate. It is a very good vehicle for education and discussion. It can tease out issues and people's feelings and it can enable a wide range of issues to be discussed, and it can aid the decision-making process. And so a question for all of us to consider is what principles and stakeholders need to be considered in an ethical matrix for educational technology? And how might we apply an ethical matrix for educational technology to a technology such as the one proposed by In Bloom? Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.